Hey guys, welcome back. This is a continuation episode of the conversation that Murray Lowe and I were having around crucial conversations. So um, my dad has trained and taught this and we wanted some really specific examples of, of the value of crucial conversations. So if you haven't listened to the episode five of season five, which was on February 3rd of 2020, Murray Lowe, Crucial Conversations and Measuring the Health of Your Practice. Go back and to listen, listen to that one first um, because this is some, some real-life examples of that. Both people who, um, someone who wasn't using this very well, and then uh, we get into some personal examples of where this, this truly does benefit your life. So, um, and it's two different audio clips, so they're kind of spliced together in the middle. But um, I think you'll really enjoy this. And there's there's an invitation at the end that uh, uh, we'll see if my dad regrets. So here we go with the interview with Murray Lowe. So we've been hearing some stories, and you shared some some very specific examples of um, Adam or Attila the Hun that you referenced as not his real name, and then actually with with Grandpa Lowe. And I I loved those stories. I love the the examples of crucial conversations and the application of it. Um, and the power of it. And so do you have any other examples that come to mind when you think of the power of crucial conversations? Oh, I have so many, uh, you bet. But l- let me tell you one that that uh, you may even recognize. And again, I'll, I'll change the name here. Um, when we were living in Indianapolis, we had a neighbor down the street. Her name was Maria, and she was from Brazil. And Maria, actually, we worked in the same company. So we were colleagues, and um, but they also lived in our neighborhood. So her and her husband, and her, she had a son and a daughter. They would come down to our house. We went over to their place for for dinner. So she was a neighbor and a colleague. Um, she came to America for two years on an expatriate assignment, and her goal or objective was to take back all of the learning she could on leadership uh, and change and crucial conversations. Take that back to Brazil and and work that uh, in the business there. Hmm. And it was really interesting because she uh, she left right after we finished the Crucial Conversations training, and she was certified to train Crucial Conversations in Portuguese. So she and she ended up training, I think, a thousand people uh, in Brazil, uh, all, all the people who were worked there uh, in Crucial Conversations. But before so, she, ever, yeah. Well, sorry, I'm interrupting here. Uh, oh. So typically when you train people, it's like a two-day thing. Yes. But then if you want to, you can get a further training and certification, become like a train-the-trainer type person. So that's additional training. And then like, what's the process for that for them? Well, you go to two additional days of training, and then you have a bunch of online resources that you need to use to then go and and deliver that into your own organization. Now, now again, just uh, just as a heads up, when I first used trained crucial conversations back in a steel company 20, uh, 23 years ago, we actually had people who were frontline supervisors who'd never had more than a high school education doing training. So the training was actually designed to be delivered by leaders, by people, mm. not by trainers. So our training is fairly user-friendly and, and fairly self-explanatory. That said, we still would take a couple of days to really, tr- really get people uh, skilled up so they could deliver number one, deliver the skills, and number two, use the skills. And I and I always tell people who who end up being training uh, trainers who come to my train the trainer. I said the number one thing you need to do to become a better trainer is you need to start using the skills, your yeah. authenticity, your ability. I don't care whether you succeed or fail, but if you start trying to use these skills and you fail, you learn. If you succeed, you'll learn too. So Maria end up ended up going back to Brazil. And Maria was interesting because she had some very inter- interesting insights about America. She would say, you know, you Americans are all crazy. You own these huge, huge, huge houses and you use them to isolate yourself from other people. And yeah. Sao- on Sao Paulo, we live in tiny houses or we live in apartments and we spend most of our time out on the street socializing and connecting with other people. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, she her, her social commentary was um, – you spend a lot of money to for privacy and you don't have have deep social connections. And it's like, yeah, she's probably yeah, that's right. True. Yeah. yeah, very true. Uh, so she, she's back in Brazil. One day uh, her husband was picking her up from work. He was an entrepreneur. And as she was being picked up from work, two guys with guns came and said, we're carjacking you. 
And so they get in the front seat and back seat and all of a sudden they're being carjacked. Now, what her is, and her husband are in the car or just her? Her and her husband. And what Maria told me, she said, I used to, I, I knew how dangerous Sao Paulo was, but after living in America for two years, we kind of forgotten and we just let our guard down just for a second. And the uh. first time, first time we let our guard down, all of a sudden there's two guys with a gun, one in the front seat, one in the back seat. And these guys are pros. They know exactly what to do. They say, give me your briefcase, give me your wallet, uh, give me your purse. And they take all your electronics. They take your laptop, your cell phone, you know, anything that they can use. And then, and then they go take all your cash and then they go through your wallet or purse and they know exactly which credit cards can get money uh, or, or, you know, or belong to banks and you can get money out of. And so what they do is they, they, They've got you in the car. They take all that away and said, okay, we're going to go to an ATM. I'm going to uh. stay in, I'm going to stay in the front seat with your husband who's driving and you're going to come with me to the ATM. And if you try anything funny, I'm in the car with pointing out with a gun with your husband and he's toast. And so <laughs> what, what normally happens oh. here is people, they, they freak out. Uh, they either, they cower like a rabbit. They get so scared, they just totally shut down. Freeze up, yeah. Or they get mad, they get angry. And these are the typical responses that carjackers have. Well, Maria, who's gone through crucial conversations, starts going, okay, I need to, this is a crucial conversation. <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to talk with this person. And, and so she's starting to think, okay, I need to, let me try and create a relationship with this person. And, you know, what's the first question that people ask you when I want to create a relationship with someone? It's like, so... Tell me who, you know, what your name is. It's like, no, that's not going to work. The next thing is, so where are you from? Hmm, that's not going to work. If I ask where they're from and what name, they're going to kill me. Uh, what do you do for a living? Well, wait a minute. I know what you do for a living. You're a criminal. You're a terrorist. You're the, you're the most despicable, uh, you know. She, so she's thinking, I need to create a relationship with this person, but I need to create enough of a relationship that, Maybe they can change what they're doing, but not too much that they get suspicious and turn on me, right? Right, so right. Became, so, so she started thinking about what her goal or objective was in this crucial conversation, and it popped into her head. And so she said this. She said this to the carjackers. She said, I don't, I don't want you to get caught by the police. I just want this event, this carjacking, to end as soon as possible. So she said that. Uh and the other person said something. And then they go to a, an ATM. And she said every time between the ATM, she would try and engage in a, you know, a two or three sentence conversation where it wasn't about trying to figure out how I can get you caught or, you know, but it was enough, right. enough to kind of say, hey, I, I understand where you are. And yet at the same time, I want you to understand where I am. And it was very interesting. She said, uh, I didn't know if it really worked, but an hour uh, after we were carjacked, the carjackers drove us back to where we were and said, and said, you are the nicest people we carjack ever carjacked. And they got out of the car and ran away. <laughs> now, now what you need to know is this, what, what normally happens, what normally happens is they drive you to an industrial part of the town. It's at night uh, in Sao Paulo and it's, and you don't, you don't have a cell phone anymore. You don't have any means of communication. And you're usually two or three miles from any cell phone and every business is closed. And they leave you on the side of the road where you are terrorized, alone, you've got nothing. And, you know, you've just been through this ordeal. Instead, you know, they end up getting their car back and it ends up, instead of being, a, you know, an all, an all night ordeal, ends up, you know, being a one hour ordeal. So that's, that's a great use of <laughs> crucial conversations. Uh, <laughs> And but what Maria was, yeah, what she did was she started thinking about how do I create a relationship with this person? How do I create a win-win here? And what are some things I can say that express what I want and also let them, you know, feel good about who they are too? <laughs> wow. Yeah. How, man, I just, you don't realize how good you have it until you hear, hear stories like that of just like, oh yeah, no, this happens and you have to be on your guard so this doesn't happen at any moment. Um, and how awful they had to go through this. But it could have been worse. Oh, way worse. I mean, they were still terrorized. Now she gets to go teach crucial conversations <laughs> to people and tell the story to people. And people are like, oh, yeah, this is this worked. It, it, it really, you know, so, sometimes people uh, say to me, you know, this isn't a crucial conversation. This is a mega crucial conversation. You know, if I have to talk to my wife about getting divorced or, you know, yeah. uh, you know, it, there, there are some conversations that are not 
crucial conversations. They're mega crucial conversations. They're, they're, they're life-changing conversations. Yeah, and then they're once in a life. And that's when you need these skills most. I mean, the, right. the cool thing about it is not only do they help in, in all the types of conversations you're going to have in your dental practice, but if you think your partner is cheating money from you or you think your you know your husband is cheating on you or you know your your parent uh, you know as i've talked about you one of your parents has some health concerns um these will work in the small things but they also work in the big big really really tough ones too so i would ask that question what do i really want to change here what positive thing do i want what do i really want that's an upside for the other person. How can they benefit from this conversation? What do I really want for our relationship? What do I really want for our practice? So that, what do I really want? What are the, what's a, what's an upside for all those things? What do I want to change here? How can they benefit from the conversation? So yeah, the, having those goals and knowing those beforehand. So as I said before, the, the, the fun thing about crucial conversations is there's their layers and what's below the surface are my intentions or goals, which is what do I re- what do they want, and the emotions and the and the goals and the emotions, you uh, may not have the best skills and say all the right things in the right way, and and you might get defensive and might get frustrated. But if but if you have really really positive goals, and you go in with the right kind of emotions, nine times out of ten it'll work. I mean, so the so the nice thing about crucial conversations is that it's principle based and skill based. More important than the skills, though, are the principles. And if you've got those goals mapped out, so, so the thing I always say is if possible, plan and prepare for a crucial conversation. It's not always possible. You know, a, 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 a patient all of a sudden starts yelling at you or, you know, the, some things just kind of spring up develop, on you, yeah. they develop and you do, you deal with them, handle, with, handle them best you can. But the beauty of a crucial conversation, if you can plan it, is you can plan to make this thing a positive event. And you ought to be going into this thinking, Okay, we got positive goals. I've got positive emotions. I'm going to bring in positive talk, and we're going to resolve this positively. And you've you've got these things. You know, you go in with a very very different different mindset than um, you've done typically in the past. At least for me. Uh, so so the problem I had growing up is I never saw my parents argue. Mm. So in crucial conversations, we talk about whether you go to silence or violence. And silence is where you see a problem and you say nothing. You don't address it, right? That's um, that's my default style. Well, you probably never saw us argue. Our our younger your younger sister has seen mom and dad argue more than you ever saw us argue. So did you was that a shift? Did you guys try and argue in front of Anna more than you did? Absolutely. That's we, so funny because I I tighten up so quickly if Christine and I are having like a conversation. I do exactly what you guys did, which is I'm like, hun, I don't want to talk about this in front of the girls. The well, <laughs> then, then they will, they'll do the same thing. They'll do the same thing as they grow up. I don't want to talk. In it. So, so absolutely. And, and, and Anna at times would say, guys, I don't want to hear you argue. It's like, we'd say, no, you need to hear us argue because that's what happens in relationships. And you've got to be able to work through this. Poor Anna. <laughs> yes. I was, I was shielded. From, yeah. I just thought you guys were perfect. So. See, but, but what happens when you go to silence is interesting. So if, if you see someone in your practice, say someone's coming late or someone's doing something wrong and you say nothing to them about it, what do you, what do you, what happens? You're what giving you, them permission that that's yeah. okay. And that's the new normal. You've just set the bar, right? You just lowered the bar. That is the new standard you've set. And so, you know, I always say that the standards you set in your practice or your office are not what you ask people to do. It's what you hold people accountable to do. And so, yes, by saying nothing, we lower the standard. Uh, and then what happens is oftentimes we say nothing, we say nothing, we say nothing, we say nothing. And then one day we can't take it any longer. And we explode. We go from silence to violence, right? It's, it's that passive aggressive. So we we say nothing. And then by the time we bring it up, we're so frustrated and annoyed and so upset. And, and we don't have our emotions in the right spot. And we don't have positive goals or outcomes. And we just, we go from one extreme to the other. Uh, and then we go back and say, oh, well, that didn't work. Yeah. And then we, we, we avoid having these conversations. Well, there is a there's a very different way to approach those types of situations where you don't have to say nothing and you don't have to explode and and it's nice you know i've i've spoken with uh i've worked with people from all around the world and it's and it's interesting particularly people from other cultures who who come to north america and i've worked with people from asia from um eastern europe from africa from south america and they're like 
I had no idea that there was so much behind communications. So, so communications, when, when, when you look at communications, a lot of people are really literal and they think, okay, you know, people are saying what they mean and all that matters are the words that are coming out of their mouth and the words that are coming out of my mouth. And the reality is there's so much more than that. Mm. Right. And, 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 and what we're asking people is pay attention Pay attention to the layers that you're bringing into the conversation, the layers other people are bringing into the conversations, and you can bring them back just to an honest and open conversation. And, and so we're talking about things like tone and body language and all of those things that can communicate, you know, even though they're saying one thing, they're meaning another, and, and you can tell, but, you know, you're saying the same words, but you say it five different ways based on the emotional layering and the tone, the body language, and, and it comes across very, very differently. So, you know, we, we talked about those questions, you know, what do I really want? What do I want for right. me, for them, oh, for, for let, let me go back to the other question, which was why would a reasonable, rational, decent human being? So, so we talk about those victim, villain, helpless stories, right? I talked about those are the stories that make us feel bad. And, and again, in my life, I've noticed anytime I'm feeling negatively about something, I'm always telling victim, villain, helpless stories, always. And so... Um, you've got to do at least two things. One is you've got to take ownership for your role and you'd say, what am I missing? What, what have I been doing? Where did I go to silence or violence or where did I not do what I should have been doing? And if you take, if you take responsibility that then you change yourself from a victim into a actor or contributor an owner, I, I, I need to, I need to take some ownership for the problem that's happening here and not just blame the other person entirely. So, so the first thing you got to do is take ownership and ask yourself, what am I missing? And then the second thing uh, which is even more and more powerful was why would a reasonable, rational, decent human being, and I always say with a mother, right. why would a reasonable, rational, decent human being with a mother do what they're doing? What's a positive reason why they're doing what they're doing? And, uh, you, you know, it's really interesting. I, I coached an executive back in 2006 in the financial services industry. His name was Adam. That's not his real name, but he, he, he was running a half billion dollar business unit for a bank and doing an amazing job, but his nickname was Attila the Hun. He hit, pl he hit plan every year, but people described this guy like he was Hitler. I mean, he was abusive. Um, he was a bully. He uh, was hurtful. He would yell and scream and swear and, you know, put people in their place. People would describe him. Um, there were, there were three or four, if you worked with Adam, that's again, it's not his real name, they would say, you know, one of two things, you're either going to get fired, you're going to quit, or you're going to be in a therapist probably within three months. You know, that, <laughs> it was, it was a really interesting um, to, to listen to people. And, and they would say, Adam doesn't care. You know, Adam's biggest problem, he doesn't care about people. Mm. He just doesn't care about people. Just cares about numbers. Just cares about numbers. Just cares about results. And, and I got to know Adam really well. I was coaching him. And I, the CEO said to him, you need to change. You need to turn your behavior around. If you don't turn your behavior around, um, you're gone. So I started working with him to turn around his behavior. And one time we got into a conversation about hitting plan. I said, "What would happen if you don't hit plan? You know, if you don't hit your numbers?" Well, said, that doesn't happen. I said, "Well, no, no. What what would happen?" Hypothetically. Hypothetically, I said that doesn't happen. I said, "Well, no. What would you do if you didn't hit numbers?" And he would sit, and he finally he looked and he said, I'd be a failure. And at that point in time, you know, I, I realized Adam actually cared too much about his numbers. It's not that he didn't care about people. He only had so much caring in his body and a hundred percent of his caring went to his numbers and none of it went to people, but he didn't have an identity outside of his numbers. Uh. His entire self-worth, he, he was not a person except I, for his numbers. It's not, it's not, I, I would have failed. It's I'd be a failure. I'd be a failure. I'd be a failure. And even when you work with people who you don't think have any redeeming qualities, there are reasons why people do what they do. And usually they're human reasons. And so uh, it's being able to humanize uh, and, and deal with diversity of perspectives and opinions. You know, one of, one of the interesting things about crucial conversations, I always tell people, I said, there's a limit to how good you can be at crucial conversations. Cause if you're bigoted, you're biased, you're prejudiced, you know, if you're sexist, if you're um, entitled, you know, if you think you're better than other people, it won't work. Mm -hmm. 
Right. People will see through it. They see through it. And so in order to become good at crucial conversations, you've got to become a better person. Mm. And, and um, so that's, that's the fun thing is not, not only does it make you a better communicator, communicator makes you a better person and helps you to, to, again, in my mind, connect with others in a way that you wouldn't be able to connect otherwise. Well, and, and for me, the reason I love that question of why would a reasonable, rational person do this is that it brings like a curiosity to your conversation rather than a set of assumptions. It's like someone, you know, your assistant doesn't have a certain instrument ready or doesn't have something ready, even though you've talked about this before, and you just assume that it's because they don't care or it's because, you know, it's like if they paid more attention, if they were a better person and they were a better employee and I just need to fire them, find someone else. Well, maybe it turns out that the reason they never have this thing is because you've only got one of them and there's the sterilizer is always kind of backed up. And so there's all these things that can explain why this thing isn't ready for you. Um, and if you'd come in hard charging and said, why don't you care about our practice? Because I always want this ready and you don't have it. I need this instrument every procedure. And she's like, well, there's only one of them and the sterilizers. You know, the, if you'd come in with that set of assumptions of understanding the why behind someone's behavior, then you could instantly damage your, the relationship rather than coming in with how can I, you know, why would a reasonable, rational person do this? Um Maybe there's something to learn here for me. Maybe there's something that we can improve as a practice. Maybe there was something going on with this person, or maybe they really don't care, and and that is the problem to deal with. But but now you know if if you come at it with that curiosity, maybe you'll actually get that out of them rather than them getting defensive and frustrated and and arguing back. For sure, uh, we call we call that the fundamental attribution error. Is that we assume that. The reason people don't do things is because they're lazy and they're unmotiv unmotivated and we don't care. Uh, and, and when that happens, we come in as judge, jury, and executioner. And when you come in, so so one of the underlying principles, as I said, there's lots of principles, but one of the underlying principles you outlined is you want to come in with curiosity rather than judgment. If you come in with curiosity um, and an assumption that the other person is doing their best rather than judgment – then you'll get to a place where you probably can get to a root cause. If you if you come in with the judge, jury, and executioner mindset, um, you can get compliance, but you'll never make things better. In fact, you'll make you'll, you'll make the relationship worse. And nine times out of ten, you'll miss what really happened. And so, yeah, that that underlying curiosity is is critical and important. And let me add that it's also important what you say. So so there is a mechanics piece of it, right? So okay. I said there were three things, right? I said the first thing is knowing your goals, what you really want. Second thing is your emotional state. The third, the third piece, and again, this is hard to boil down a two-day workshop into into thirty minutes. And and I hope the authors don't. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe maybe I could get them on. I don't know. We'll we'll see if we can. I'm po I, yeah, there is a possibility. Um, but the third thing is this: is that you've got to bring this up verbally in a way that that expresses that positivity, uh, and that gives them an opportunity to talk about it. Right. And so, so uh, I always start with a little bit of preamble before I get into a crucial conversation that, that expresses my intention that says, Hey, I want to work on this issue and I want to do it in a way that improves how we work together too. Right. So that, that, that's some of the positivity. And then I want to talk about the issue. And, and the way we do that is just be, to be very factual. You know, I expected this and this happened or so. And the way I talk about that is, is to uh, almost be like Sheldon and Big, ba Big Bang Theory. So you do want to be very factual when you're actually addressing an issue or a problem. So describe what you saw, heard, or, or noticed. And so I, I usually give people a sentence to say, hey, I noticed that. And then you, you bring that in. Uh, and then I would give a simple, um, okay, here's the, not only did I notice that, but then we talk about a story or here's the, uh, implication of that or the interpretation of that. And then I'd ask a question. So do we have, do I have time to tell you a quick story? Yeah, let's do it. This is a, this is a personal story, uh, crucial conversations. And actually this happened with my dad, your grandpa, yeah, who happens to be named Richard, right. <laughs> who you're named after. So um, we were living in Indianapolis and there was a wedding here in Salt Lake city. And uh, I flew in and my dad and my mom and my, my sister picked me up at the airport. 
Uh, it was a Saturday morning. The wedding was uh, in the early afternoon. We had a few few minutes to spare. So my sister said, hey, um, before we go to the wedding this afternoon, I want to go pick up some shoes uh, and um, let's, go, let's go to the Fashion Place Mall. So I remember looking down at my feet and, and it was interesting because I, I just started working, doing some work with uh, Crucial Conversations in Indiana, but I was also doing some consulting on the side and I was working with a, a company called Citigroup. <laughs> they have 300,000 employees. We were working with the top 300 leaders of a 300,000 person company wow. on Wall Street. And uh, this was Saturday, Sunday night, I was flying out to New York, to Manhattan. And I had a workshop on Monday and I, I had asked, I said, what do I need to wear to a, a, a workshop on Wall Street? And the guy said, well, you just need to look like you belong. You know, you need to have good stuff. And so I looked at my shoes and said, good idea. <laughs> so we go to the mall and my mom and my sister run off and I'm getting ready to uh, to uh, do this. But but I had a tight connection. And so I, I, I put my dad in charge, just me and dad. I said, dad, we've only got an hour at most. I don't want to, don't want to waste any time. Will you look at the small map and find the, the shoe store where you can go? We'll look at shoes. And I ran into the food court, uh, got some Chinese food. I, I only had a few minutes. And I remember I'm chowing down on my food and I look at my watch. It's like eight minutes later and dad hadn't come back. So I literally stood up for my food, walked out of the food court and went around the corner. And I look at my dad in front of the, and he's still in front of this, this mall map and he's scratching his head. I thought, hmm, that's weird. So ran back, finished my food as quickly as I could. Went back to dad. I said, dad, where's the shoe store? And he said, Murray, I can't find it. Now, now you know, some of these shoe stores are literally, these mall maps are higher, in hieroglyphics, right? They're not easy to understand, but this one was simple. I mean, I, I looked, it said, uh, it was Shoes. alphabetical, you know? So I would, men's footwear, I was there in a second. And I knew immediately it was right around the corner. I thought, well, that was weird. As we're walking to the shoe store, I thought, well, wait, wait a minute, he turned 80 a couple, couple months ago. Hmm, weird. So bought some new shoes, went to the wedding. After the wedding, we're staying around congratulating each other. My brother-in-law, John, comes up to my dad and looks down on his left, left foot and says, so tell me, Dick, um, do you have another pair of shoes like that at home? And my dad looks down and goes, oh my goodness, on his left foot, he's got this brand new shoe from the shoe store we just visited. What, what does that mean? So he left one of his actual shoes at the shoe store and took one of the new shoes without buying them. Right. And so he did that. And, and of course I was kind of aghast. Other people were kind of teasing him, but I'm, I'm like, this is nuts. And I ended up having to take that back, the shoe back. I did the shoe switch. It's another story for another day. But I, when I got back to Indiana, it's like, what's going on? So I sent a message to my brothers and sisters there in Canada where my parents lived. I said, what's going on with dad? I think he's losing it. And uh, got a bunch of email me messages back. Oh yeah, all of a sudden realized there's a problem, right? right? Then I sent another message saying, well, what should we do? Maybe we should talk to him about it. And they said, no, I got a, way more information back saying anytime you talk to, about, talk to dad about aging, he gets defensive, he feels disrespectful and it just goes really badly. And, and so I, I sent a message back to him and said, you know, I, I teach this course and in the course, one of the principles we teach is if you can make it safe, you can talk to almost anyone about almost anything. And I said, I think we should say something to dad because if we say nothing, right, then that's going to make the problem worse. So my siblings are like, great, you go ahead and do that. We're happy <laughs> to have you do that. I said, Your okay. Turn. You're it. You're it. And, and so I did. I, I sent him a message. Actually, we talked. I said, dad, I want to talk to you about something kind of sensitive next Sunday. Are you up for that? He said, sure. Mom called back on Wednesday. Can I join too? I said, of course. We always talk together as a group on Sundays. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to get talk to my dad. Now, again, this, this is a little more than what we've talked about. I mean, here. essentially you're, you're having to tell grandpa, I think you're going senile. I mean, you're, yeah, I think, well, which I think is a hard conversation to have. I think, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I want to have this in a positive way. Now there's one thing I haven't talked about yet. And there's, there's more stuff in crucial conversations, but one, one thing that people do is they get defensive because they take things wrong. And, and we already know that my dad would get defensive when, when you talk to him about aging because he feels like you're calling him old. But there's another thing people get defensive when you talk to them when they're old about. What do you think that might be? Any ideas? What do they think you're going to do when you talk to them about being senile? Put them in a home. Right. And so I actually started there. So, so get dad on the phone. I said, dad, 
Thanks for being on the phone today. Really appreciate you doing this. Um, before we start, I need you to understand two things. I said, first of all, Dad, I want you to know that you're my hero. And Dad, what I'm going to say today won't change the way I feel about you. I, I've seen you age so gracefully. You know, when you were 77, you and your brother backpacked the Grand Canyon. You've been an, you've been an amazing father and an amazing example as you've grown older. And, and I really appreciate that. And then I said, secondly, Dad, I'm not here to influence your choices. I'm just going to give you some information and you can decide what to do about it. And then I jump in. We got to have some positive language, but I'm going to be factual, right? Hey, I, I, wa I want to work on this issue and I want to make sure that, that it brings us closest to, closer together. Hey, last month at the wedding, uh, I noticed that um, you couldn't find the shoe store on the, on the mall map, but it took me just a second to find it. And then there was the shoe mix up. And he said, yeah, that was embarrassing. Now, am I done if I just say that? No, yeah. I mean, you haven't really brought up what you're... Yeah. So you, you talk about facts and then you've got to talk about why you're bringing it up, what the, what the interpretation is. And I said, Dad, I'm beginning to wonder if something's changing for you cognitively. It appears there could be symptoms of a disease. And if there is, maybe we can do something about it. And then I said, so tell me, Dad, has anything changed? Yeah, there's a silence on the other end of the phone. It was like five seconds. It felt like an hour, but it's just a few seconds. And then he said, yeah, Murray, something has changed. And mom's almost on the phone. She said, yeah, Dick, when we went to Costco last week, it took you 10 minutes to find the pizzas. And I, I'm screaming in my head. So I'm not saying this verbally, but in my head, I'm screaming, shut up, mom. Shut right, up. You're right. not adding You're value. Not now, now, she must have heard me because... She didn't say anything the entire rest of the conversation. That was the only thing she said in the entire conversation. And we ended up having a 20-minute conversation. It wasn't three hours. It wasn't an hour. It was 20, 25 minutes. And at the end of the conversation, I said, Dad, if I send you some information about Alzheimer's, will you go and get checked out? And he said, yeah, I, I think I can do that. That kind of makes sense. And then he said, this was the, 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 my favorite part of the whole conversation. He said, Murray, I want to thank you for bringing this up. Mm -hmm. Oh crap, this stuff works. This crucial conversation works so good. And, and, and that was amazing. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he did go to a doctor, he went to an onco a gerontologist who works with older people. And they told him he didn't have Al Alzheimer's. He's got something called MCI, which is called mild cognitive impairment. You need to watch for it in me okay. <laughs> someday. That means, uh, and so what happens with, uh, with Alzheimer's and dementia is you start seeing early warning signs, but they're not necessarily treatable. And up in Canada, in fact, um, they don't treat it with medication. I, I worked for a pharmaceutical company. I went and talked to people and said, what do you do? They said, well, the aggressive thing is you, you want to start treating it as soon as possible because the medication doesn't make you better. It just prevents you from getting worse. Uh. And so it goes down almost in, in, it goes down in steps and it says it might keep him, basically what it does, it allows your body to catch up to your mind physically. So not, not great prognosis. Right. Um, so, Dad went to the doctor and he's like, nah, you know, this is not a heart disease thing. This isn't, you know, chronic. I'm not going to die from this. I'm not sure I need to do that. Well, a few months later, we were up in Canada at a family reunion and I was talking to my cousin and my dad and my, I have an uncle, they're identical twins and my cousin's a doctor. And uh, I said, Brian, you know, Dick and Bob, these guys have got some cognitive twin, issues. Twin brothers. Twin brothers. These guys have got some cognitive issues. They just turned 80. Let's get them some medication. And my cousin's like, mm, uh, I don't know how effective or, you know, I'm not really sure these medications work all that much. And, you know, he was he was uh, waffling. And as, as, as Nadine and I went back to Indiana, I looked at her and said, you know, our parents live in Canada and there's no crucial, there's no crucial conversations in Canada. I said, let's, let's go home. We'll work with our parents and we'll bring this amazing tool set to Canada. And we did, we did both. Uh, and it worked on both perspectives. We got to be home with our parents in the last years of our lives. And we got to have a very successful business working with thousands of people and helping them improve their crucial conversation skills. No. And the amazing thing about that is whenever I hear an example of a crucial conversation done right, it doesn't sound that hard. Like it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, the context makes it like, okay, that would be hard. But then you, when you actually do it, you're like, oh, wow. Like that's not, um, it just, it just comes off so like naturally, but it's not natural to be at that point. The natural thing is to, 
to screw it up royally, which is what the majority of us do all the time with every single, or the majority of, of these crucial conversations. So I, I think uh, we'll have to have some more examples in the future because to internalize that, and you know, obviously if people want to go get the book, if they want you know more training and, and opportunity to, to learn this, there's a lot out there uh, that Vital Smarts has put out. But um, it's it's kind of like artful. It's it's kind of like a, a when you see it happen, you're like, oh, well, yeah, of course. Like it makes so much sense. But then you you turn around and you try and apply it the next time yourself, and you're like, what was that? And you you, you forget. And so it's this process of learning and applying and learning and applying um, that unfortunately is is not as easy as it would seem. T- totally. And fortunately, the, the framework or model, the, the process that they use in Crucial, you know, what you do is you can literally figure out where you screwed up. So you know, I always tell people when you kill a conversation, do an autopsy, right? You know, you're going to do a CSI Miami or you're going to literally go back and, and the model is so robust that you can 99% of the time you can figure out, okay, here's what went wrong. Here's why it went off the rails. And it was what I did, what they did, and here's how I can get it back. So, so the nice thing is, so, so I always tell people after they come to training, I said, you're bad. Num- two things are going to happen. Number one, your batting average is going to go up. And number two, you're probably going to try harder conversations and you're not going to succeed. And when you don't succeed, um, if you use the, if you use the model or framework and look at the skill set, you can figure out why it went wrong and you can learn from that. So, so the nice thing is, is whether it works or it doesn't, you, you end up seeing the power. Like I said, the, the model is so powerful and practical. It gives you a guide as to what you should do. And then it also gives you an assessment of what, what actually happened. It's pretty, pretty amazing that way. Well, cool. Well, thank you for sharing both some tidbits, your, your journey, some really specific examples um, we'll, we'll have a whole lot more to talk about with leadership. Maybe we'll do kind of a little refresher or the beginning or the end of one of our segments. We can kind of touch back on some of these skills because they are so vital. They're, they're extremely powerful, um, but they require practice. They require understanding. And, um, I've, I've benefited and I've also rolled my eyes at all of this. And, and so I've, <laughs> I've been both the skeptic and the benefactor, and I still suck at a lot of this. Um, it's, it's one of those things that, personally, almost more than professionally, you know, you, you can have these types of crucial conversations at home in a relationship daily, you know, weekly or daily. And, and there's so much opportunity to practice because real life, and especially around the people that we care about the most, we tend to screw this up the most. You get to practice these skills at work, and then you get to use them at home where they matter the most. Absolutely. And, and in fact, if, if they didn't work in all those different scenarios, it would be a very weak, crappy, useless tool set. The fact that it works in every different circumstance is an indication of how powerful, how resilient, how impactful the skills really are. Um, one question I have, because yeah. we talked about kind of the training of all of this, um, say that a dentist is like, okay, I, I really want to work on this. And, and you know, we've talked about it in a previous episode, you know, don't overcommit yourself to the, your change efforts uh, of trying to change too many things at once. Say that someone wanted to go all in and do the workshop and, you know, they'd get the book, do the workshop. You know, how reasonable is this for an individual or for an office or for a team to go through this training? Um, so the most important, it's very reasonable. The most important thing though is to say, what is my plan for after the training? It's very reasonable, but you have to understand that it's use it or lose it. You know, I have trained thousands of people. And in fact, uh, I was up in Canada in Calgary and I would run into people that I trained a year before and I would ask how they did with the skills. And if they used it, they'd say, great, I've done this, this, this. And if they didn't, they would kind of look at me and go, oh, that was a good class. I should, you know, learn more about this. So, so if you, the important thing you you need to understand in going to crucial conversations, either a two-day training or even bringing in a trainer to work with your office or sending your whole office to a public class, because there, there are lots of options available, is to say, what is the follow-up plan? Because uh, just like you know, going to dental school, you would take semesters or terms, and those were four months long. I always t- tell people, 
if you want to get really good at something, you got to, you got to do it for three or four months, which means you got to be practicing using the skills. You've got to be reviewing at a high level what the principles are. You ought to be reading the book or listening to the audio CDs so that, so that you internalize that. So if you've got the internalization strategy, uh, internalization strategy, um, yeah, you, you can really do that well. Um, I work with people all the time, helping people deal with conversations. Some of them really, really tough. I mean, the, the hardest conversations are usually with your boss or your partner, uh, where there's some serious, serious differences and, um, uh, or, or, or your, your, uh, 25 year old son who refuses to leave your basement and still playing video games. That's another one altogether, but, but, uh, no, I have my own video game basement. I don't need yours, dad. There you go. So, uh, <laughs> it's, there's all, there's also follow-up resources that can help you, uh, if you need to apply it, but, the, but the key is you have to apply it. If you don't, if you just go to the training and you don't use it, um, you'll have greater awareness. In fact, you'll be more frustrated because you'll know, you'll, you'll know where you're mm-hmm. screwing up and you'll feel worse about your communication rather than better. Hmm. No. And, and I'm guilty of this as well, of, of having been exposed to all of this so many times and talked about it with you and read the books and listened to the audiobooks and hear you train. And then I'll admit there are like years where I don't think about crucial conversations. And it's not that I didn't have crucial conversations in that year. It's just that I, I probably didn't prepare for them and clarify for myself and, and work through them with the skills that I could have. Um, but then every time that I have one coming up and I call you and I say, hey, got this conversation. Here's, here's what I'm thinking of saying. You know, what should I say differently? What am I missing? You know, those end up being extremely beneficial. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad I do every single time, but yeah, you have to work on this. And, and I'm a, I'm a perfect example of someone who, who's been exposed to the information and needs a lot more implementation work, but you know, that's, that's a lot of people. Well, and and now that you bring that up, I have a planner. So I send people here is a two page planner. Here's what you need to plan before. I'm not sure I've ever sent you that. So (laughs) maybe you're, maybe you're working, uh, trying to do it from memory as opposed to, you know, the people who really do come to the full two days training, I give them a planner. Here's all the things you need to work through. Here's all the things you need to think about. You've just gone through that. So, so you're better off following a process or making it a system. Is it a book like a like a like no. flip through? No, it's a, it's a word document. It's two it's two pages, and it just asks asks you to apply each of the skills of crucial conversations, kind of in a sequ- sequential process. So, I don't think I've ever sent it to you. Okay, well then I'll I'll take the blame off of myself. I feel this load lifted right now off my shoulders. So, um, I'm excited for the planner. Um, would that be something appropriate for someone new to this, or would that be more like on the back end of? Uh, having done a lot of this work, it would be on the back end because uh, for someone new, they they wouldn't understand the context, and they would probably. Um, so 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 the cool thing about crucial conversations is it goes into a lot of depth. So you can handle anything. If someone yells and screams at you, if someone cries, I mean, it, it literally prepares you for the worst case scenario in a conversation, and there's a lot that goes into that. Um, so if you, if you, if you try this with, with, um, so, so let me say this differently about 5% of the people who, who read a book are able to take that book and apply it without having to go for, through a training where they, they really internalize that the rest of us mere mortals. And I'm myself, I'm in the category as well. I literally have to go and sit with that material a little more deeply and internalize it and, and learn what it really means before I can apply it. So, so you might be one of those people that can just read a book and pick it up and do stuff. Uh, but if you're like most people, you need a little more. So I, I don't give that to people who haven't read the book, uh, who have, who we, who haven't been through training or, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I coach people all the time in my coaching practice about crucial conversations, but I never start with that because that, that's not, that's not helpful. It actually, um, is a little dangerous in some ways. Well, then um, I think we would continue to direct people to just go buy the book, uh, whether you buy the audiobook or Kindle or, or whatever, because um, there's just so much there and and is, you know, going to be the foundation for whatever you do with this moving forward. So you, you need the book. Just just go get the book. Absolutely. And I don't get any royalties on that. You need the book. And if you really want to 
So, so a book creates understanding. If you really want change, I would encourage you to spend a couple days um, because you need to see how you screwed up. I mean, the, the thing that a two-day training class does is that you analyze all the ways you've screwed up communicating your life. And by, by looking at those errors, you can then, okay, here's what I would do differently to fix this and fix that and fix this and fix that. So you learn from your own errors while you're applying the skills. Perfect. And, and everyone screws it up differently. So, yep. you know, how, how you screw it up is going to be different than someone else. So. <laughs> totally. Well, well, thank you for sharing some more examples. I, I honestly didn't know that. Maybe I've heard that story once before, but it's been a long, long time. So that I'm glad we got that recorded on air. And, um, and then the, the invitation is still open. We're, we're going to regret it soon. But um, if someone has some crucial conversations or some failed conversations that they want to dissect on air, we're, we're willing to talk about it. So uh, reach out to me, email me, richard at sharedpractices.com. And I'm, I'm, every time I bring this up, I'm going to put a timestamp on it. This is for early 2020. If, if you're in 2022 listening to this, that, that offer is probably passed and I probably um, am swamped with other emails. And I'd love to respond and talk about crucial conversations, but it's, it's a limited time offer. Is that fair enough to say? Absolutely. You, you can always direct them to me. I'll be, I'll be working on, I've been working on it for 23 years now, and I'll probably work on it for another 10, 15 years. So hap, I'm, I'm happy to help people out. And um, I always say, hey, if you want to talk to me about crucial conversations, I'm happy to spend 45 minutes with you for free, always, because uh, I just want people to, to be more successful in how they deal with problems with others. All right. Well, you've opened the floodgates then. So what's the email address there for people to reach out to you? Oh, it's uh, murrayrlo at gmail.com. So. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you again for being on the show. And, and this was a lot of fun. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. Okay. We'll see you. Bye now. Okay. I loved those stories. I mean, I'm, I'm a little biased because one of them was about my grandpa and, and my dad handling that situation. But then that story of that lady in Brazil, uh, first off, I told after, after recording this last night, I went and told my wife that whole story of, of the carjacking in Brazil. And she's like, I can't sleep now. Like my adrenaline is so high. I'm like so stressed for that, that family and, and that whole situation. But it just goes to show that these principles work even in life-threatening situations, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, from, from work to home and personal to the, the most extreme of situations. Uh, so once again, the invitation is open early 2020 for anyone who's interested in kind of recording something with, with me and Murray and, and whatever situation you're in. If uh, this is a year from now, that it, that window has probably closed. Sorry about that. But he did extend the invitation to reach out to him at any point in the future because this is what he does and what he coaches. And, um, he, and I'm, this this was not all a, an elaborate setup to drum up some some you know coaching and and people for for him. Um, this really was a generous sharing of these lessons that he's learned over time with us. Um, and it just so happens that he also can help people with this professionally. Um, thank you guys for leaving reviews and for sharing this show with other people. We're, as of today, right now, I, I just checked, we're at 388 five-star reviews on Apple, uh, on the iTunes store, which, which means so much to us. Thank you for everyone who's contributing on our Facebook group. And, uh, and, and for all of those users who also don't have an Apple device and can't review on the iTunes store, Thanks for for just sharing and telling other people about it and reviewing it in whatever platform you can review it on. So um, thank you. And we will talk with you next week on the Shared Practices Podcast. I'm excited to announce a partnership with Sandy Pardue. We are rebooting the Dental Drill Bits podcast. Sandy and I sat down and said, what if we did a podcast together? What if we did a whole season of, of your show together? And it works out perfectly because... I have a ton of questions and she has a ton of answers. So we combined my skill at asking questions but not necessarily knowing the answer and her skill at answering every single question with a wealth of knowledge, specific examples and experience. If you want to get your dental practice organized, if you have trouble with 
understanding the roles and the functions and the systems of your office. Join us every Tuesday on the Dental Drill Bits podcast.